Welcome to our program today, Gardening for Beginners, a Spring and Summer Guide. We're just going to wait a moment for everyone to join in and then we will begin. Welcome again, and thank you for joining us today. This is a live webinar. You have joined in listen-only mode, so although you will not be able to speak, you can ask the organizer questions via the chat module in your control panel. My name is William Gwynn, and I'm the Information Literacy Specialist at Oak Ridge Public Library, as well as the Seed Catalog Coordinator. My co-organizer who will field questions from our guest panelists is Mike Stallo, our local history specialist at Oak Ridge Public Library. Our guest panelist today, Charlotte Rodina, is co-director of Beersley Community Farm in Knoxville. Today's program will also be available through an email link, which we will send out post-program for further viewing, along with the program survey. If you know anyone who also might enjoy today's program, they can find it under programming and events on our home webpage. During this time, we are continuing to offer curbside service Monday through Saturday, one to six. You can place hands uh, holds on materials through our online digital catalog. Once holds are available, you will be notified that your items are ready. To pick up items at the library, park in one of our convenient curbside spots adjacent to the children's room. Call the number on the sign and open your trunk or roll down your window where one of our friendly staff will deliver the items to your car. We are also offering mobile printing through curbside. So if your printer is broken or you do not own a printer, you can now send a print job from your home desktop, laptop, mobile phone, or whatnot to the library. Find mobile printing directions at orpl.org. Once your print job is submitted, you can pick up prints in curbside for only 10 cents per page. Also, we are offering mobile hotspots to check out for any card holder who lacks internet access. Call the library for more details. In other exciting news, we are opening again to the public beginning on March 29th. Upon opening, our hours will be Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. In addition, from 2 to 6 p.m., curbside service 
will still be offered concurrently with indoor library access. Grab a mask and come inside to see all the building's remodeling updates and browse the collection or use one of our distanced computer stations. Beginning on May 31st, which is the second phase of our reopening, regular summer hours resume Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., and Friday and Saturday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. At this time, curbside services will cease. Although indoor programming is still on hold, outdoor in-person programming will begin on June 12th with the beginning of summer reading program. For the first time, the library will be offering a summer reading program, not only for children, but for adults as well. For more information about services and hours, go to orpl.org or look on Twitter or Facebook. Finally, apart from the chat module for assistance type questions, you will note a questions section on your control panel. After today's gardening presentation, our panelist Charlotte will take posted questions from the audience. Please save your questions for this time. Now it is Oak Ridge Public Library's pleasure to present Charlotte Rodina from Beersley Community Farm for today's Worldwise Wednesday program, Gardening for Beginners, a Spring and Summer Planting Guide. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I was just talking to the great folks at Oak Ridge Public Library about how um, timely this class is. And um, as the, the weather warms up and we get ready for spring, um, there's a lot of people excited, including myself, about getting back out there and getting things planted. And so um, thank you again for joining us. And um, I am coming from Beardley Community Farm and we're a really awesome community farm a couple of miles from downtown Knoxville. Um, and Beardsley Farm does a lot in the community. We donate produce to hunger relief organizations. We have a lot of volunteers each year. And so we have about 2000 folks who come and help us from around the community. Um, and I will say that if you are new to gardening and you wanna learn a really great way to do so is to um, head over to Beardsley Farm and help out for an afternoon or two. And you can really learn a lot that way. Um, we also offer land and resources for gardening. And so we have about 20 community gardens offsite and 25 community gardens on site that are dedicated to refugee gardeners. Um, and we also distribute seeds and plants to folks. And so we have about 10,000 seedlings that we give away at the end of April every year. And we are hard at work in our greenhouse um, this month, getting all of those ready. We also hand out big packets of seeds. Um, and we have some education opportunities at the farm, including classes such as this one. Um, and we also have events at the farm. So we do things like um, fundraisers and we have community events like our harvest festival and our egg hunt. Um, and you can also find us on social media if you wanna get updates. We um, often post on Facebook and Instagram, different events that we have going on and opportunities to get involved um, at the farm. So a little bit about my background so you know why I am talking to you about gardening today. Um, my name is Charlotte Rodina. I um, am the co-director at Beardsley Community Farm. And before that, I was the farm manager for four years there. Um, and I uh, became interested in gardening because I really love cooking food and baking. And um, that interest led into figuring out how food is grown and where it comes from and how I can get more of it in my own yard. 
so that I have access to really great fresh stuff for cooking. And um, I worked on a farm in Pittsburgh, my uncle's farm for a while and really loved it. And so I ended up working on um, more farms after that. I went to Italy and Scotland and worked on farms there and learned different methods of organic gardening and farming. Um, and I, I really loved it, so I kept doing it. I joined AmeriCorps and that's what brought me to Knoxville, Tennessee. And I worked at the Knoxville Botanical Gardens and also started a garden at the Hardin Valley campus of Fellowshipy State Community College. Um, and from there ended up at Beardsley Farm. So um, AmeriCorps was a really great opportunity to tie in service with farming and it gave more meaning behind what I was doing. And so um, Beardsley Farm is a really great place that ties those two things together. And since all of our produce gets donated, it's um, gardening, which is really fun and then um, a really great cause as well. Um, great. So we've got a lot to cover today. Um, gardening is uh, a big topic and an intro to gardening is a big topic and so we're gonna um, try and go over a lot of the basics and if you ever have questions beyond this um, I'm happy to talk to you if you ever come to Beardsley Farm about um, anything gardening or cooking related. Um, so we're going to start off by talking about ways to prepare for your garden site. So gardening, um, it takes some work, but I think the most important part of it is really just getting, um, getting everything prepared and planning for it. And once you have all of the preparation and planning done, um, it's pretty easy once you get going. So, um, these are some really beautiful gardens in the middle of summer last year at Beardsley Farm. Part of our gardens are in the park. Um, and so it's easy for people to come by even if we're not there and stroll around and look to see what we're doing and get ideas. Um, so the first thing to consider when you're going to start a garden is light. Light is very important to plants. It provides energy and heat. And most vegetables and fruits need six hours of sunlight, but eight is a lot better. So um, that means six to eight hours is considered full sunlight exposure and anything in a summer vegetable garden or spring or fall vegetable garden is gonna need six to eight hours pretty much. So things like tomatoes and summer squash that you see in this picture, um, beans, corn, lettuce, um, most of your herbs and also remember to look up because a lot of times people will start a garden in the early spring before all the leaves are out on the trees and you won't realize that come summertime the trees will leaf out and you'll have a lot um, less access to the light you thought you might have. Um, soil is another consideration when starting a garden and so um, I think it's really important to think about soil a lot. Soil is the basis of which your plant gets all of its nutrients. Um, it's where it gets its water and its air. And those are, besides light, those are the three really important things that a plant needs. And so um, we'll talk in more detail about soil later, but um, just know that loamy soil is ideal. And so that's a mixture of sand and salt and clay. Um, in East Tennessee, we are so lucky to have soil that has a lot of clay in it. And so sometimes you need to add some amendments or some different mixtures into your soil in order to get it ready for a garden. And water. So a lot of people may not realize this when they're first starting their garden, but um, being close to a spigot is really helpful. And you don't want to have to fill up watering cans from near your house and then walk it a quarter of a mile away to a garden or 
even really far away in your backyard um, because that can take a really long time in the summer, um, especially when you have a lot of plants that are really thirsty or if there's a drought. So consider um, location to access to water when you're starting a garden. Um, and there are other options too. If you don't want to use a spigot, you can use a rain barrel, which collects the water from usually a roof space from your house or from a shed or a garage. And uh, you can use that water to water your plants as well. Um, and know your site history also. So there are um, a lot of things that have happened to the land um, before we were here and even before we moved to that um, spot. And so you never know if there was, um, you know, heavy metals or something left over from industry, um, chemicals, or even ex pasture can be um, difficult to grow on because the soil gets compacted from animals. So just know what you're dealing with. Um, and along with that, um, if you're going to dig deep into the ground, you should call KUB before you dig or your utility service to make sure you're not going to hit any pipes. Um, drainage is also another consideration. So this picture is actually my backyard. So I am lucky enough to have poor drainage. And um, so you wanna, you can actually do a drainage test in your yard to see if your um, soil drains well or not. And I have a little thing on the right side here that lets you know how to do that. You can dig a 12 inch hole and fill it with water, let it drain out, and then fill it again and see how fast it drains. Um, and it should take a few hours. It shouldn't sit in there for a few days, which is usually what happens in my yard. Um, and we'll talk about some different ways to deal with this later. But um, in my case, what I ended up deciding to do for most of my vegetable gardens that are in my backyard is I just built raised beds. And so um, that was a quick way for me to not have to deal with the drainage issue. Um, and then I also am dealing with it by having a rain garden at my house. And so um, that could be a whole nother class. But for now, just know that you want to make sure you're not planting your plants in waterlogged soil because there's no ox oxygen um, for your plants. And uh, a lot of roots will rot in that kind of situation. Um, and then lastly, when you are choosing where to start your garden, you also want to consider slope. Um, so water is likely to run off the side of a hill. So if you're going to start a garden on a hill, I would recommend terracing it, which means um, cutting into it to make level platforms along the hill. Um, and also realize that at the bottom of a hill, there could be um, pooling water and there can also be microclimate. So um, there's differences in temperature at the top of a hill and at the bottom of a hill that you may want to consider when you're planting. All right, so once you have considered all of those things and gotten your garden um, set up and you've decided um, the perfect spot for it at your house, um, there's going to be a little bit of planning and preparation to do. Um, and the first thing you want to think about is choosing what kind of bed to put in. So um, on the left side here, this is also at Beardsley Farm, these are in ground beds um, with rows down the centers. Um, and then on the right side, you can see raised beds. Um, and so there's pros and cons to both. Um, with raised beds, there's an increased accessibility. So you can build even taller ones than you see here if you have trouble bending over. Um, or if you have bad knees, you might consider making tall raised beds that you can access easier. Um, but raised beds 
usually costs more money because you have to buy the wood materials and you also have to usually bring in extra soil to fill them up. Um, they can be easier to maintain because the weeds um, can't really penetrate through the same way as they do in the in-ground in gardens. Um, and so you can have easier um, control over weeds with raised beds. And um, so that's definitely a big pro for a lot of people. And then in-ground gardens, so they may be harder to maintain in terms of weeds. And um, so that's one consideration, depends on how much time you have, but also they're a lot cheaper um, there's a lot less watering to do because there's access to the ground underneath um, and they don't drain as fast as a raised bed. And so um, you usually have to water in ground beds less and um, there's also more bending over though. So as you can see, pros and cons with my situation in my own backyard at home, um, the decision was easy because I knew I had very poor drainage and so I um, chose raised beds. Um, but we're going to pause really quick right here. We have a poll question for you all and um, the question is going to be about your preferences for um, a type of garden bed. So do you prefer an in-ground bed or a raised bed or container or Maybe you have no preference. Maybe you like both. I don't know if those are answers, but. We'll just give you a few minutes to answer that, or a few seconds rather. Um, I like having a mixture of both for different reasons. Okay, so we got some answers. So most people would prefer raised bed. Um, great, that's good to know. Um, there's, like I said, a lot of pros to having raised beds. And I think, you know, if, you're, if your full-time job is not farming, it's, uh, it can save a lot of time. All right, so. Um, moving on to some information about the soil. Um, let's see. So the soil in your garden is really important. Um, I honestly think this is the most important part is um, for keeping a plant healthy is having a very healthy soil. So um, to start out, what I do usually is remove rocks or other objects, um, remove weeds. And so if I'm starting a whole new plot in the ground or even a raised bed, um, I usually take off the top layer of um, grass and you can scrape that right off with a shovel and it's usually just about four inches. I don't want to go too deep into the ground because the topsoil is very important, but I'll take that, uh, I'll take the weeds and grass right off. And if I have enough time to prepare and plan, I will also um, solarize the area. And so what that means is you can take um, plastic or you can take uh, black plastic or clear plastic and put it um, over the area where you want to garden and let that sit there for as long as you can. So if possible, if you have enough time to plant, you would do that the summer before and keep it there for six to eight months. But um, even one month or two months is really great. And so what's happening there is the heat from the sun is killing the weed seeds and um, making it so nothing can grow. 
no weeds can grow and kills them off before you get your garden started because even if you do remove the top layer of sod there's um, still a a lot of weed seeds in there that can survive and grow back up really soon um, I also talk a little bit about um, on this slide you can see lightly turn the soil to aid aeration and drainage so what I will usually do next is add some compost or um, organic matter manure that has been aged um, and lightly use a broad fork or um, some hand tools and just mix that in. Um, we'll talk about this more later but I also recommend soil testing because um, you you probably don't know what nutrients are in your soil um, unless you are a soil scientist. And so getting a test is pretty easy to do and I'll talk about that. And um, that can help you figure out what kind of organic matter or amendments to add. And then um, lastly, I will just mention a lot of people wanna just go out there and till, till, till and um, you know, either with a tractor if you have access to it or um, a hand tiller. And I think this is okay sometimes to get started, but I also um, really have found that I prefer no-till. And that means that um, I do the process I was just explaining and maybe a little bit of tilling by hand, but essentially just adding lots of organic matter and layers of um, compost and manure each season rather than stirring up the soil with a tiller. Um, tilling often compacts the soil so much that um, it becomes uninhabitable to the um, you know creatures in there that are helping to aerate things um, like the earthworms and it also just stirs up the weeds um, and the weed seeds and brings them to the surface so that they sprout even sooner. Um, so I try to avoid it. Um, so soil testing. So um, we have a really great resource and we can get our soil tested through UT. Um, I think it costs seven dollars. It's pretty um, affordable and um, you can usually get these little boxes you see here at Mayo Garden Center. Um, and you can probably get one through UT as well. Um, and so these tests are really important because they tell you what your soil needs. And, um, you know, you, you have three main nutrients that your soil needs. There's um, potassium and phosphorus and then also nitrogen and this test will tell you that and you can get an advanced test to tell you even all of the um, the micronutrients that are needed so that can help you decide what kind of amendments to add to your soil and to get it ready for your plants and your vegetables your fruits Um, and there's some really great resources on UT Extension's website about reading a soil test. So I'm not going to spend too much time getting into that, but um, I have some links at the very end of this presentation that will take you through um, to get you to these resources and show you how you can read your soil test because it can get a little confusing. Um, especially if you're testing multiple areas and um, choosing different plants because um, you can choose uh, whether or not you want to test for viability for vegetables or fruits or turf even. Um, so there's different crop codes and all that and so um, just know that this resource is available and I'm going to Give you guys access to that at the end. Um, so next up we have choosing your crops and um, it's really important to realize that there's different seasons for different crops and there's warm season crops and cool season crops. So we're going to pause again real quick and do another, uh, another poll. 
Um, and this time we are curious to know um, if you prefer warm season crops such as tomatoes, okra, eggplants, beans, winter squash, summer squash, peppers, melon, cucumber, all that good stuff, or cool season crops, which are things like lettuce and cabbage, beets, carrots, turnips, and all that. Or both. I like both. I'll give you uh, 10 or 20 more seconds for that. Okay. So it looks like most people either like both or warm weather crops, which is kind of what I suspected. Um, I know that summer gardens are usually the most popular because who doesn't love a homegrown tomato and um, cucumber to make pickles and all that. Um, but there's really a lot of really great things you can grow in the fall and the spring as well. And so um, when choosing your crops, just realize that there's different dates and times to plant everything. Um, and I will warn you that there's a lot of um, big box stores that will try to sell you tomatoes right now and peppers right now. And um, it's definitely too early to plant those things. And they don't really bother to um, steer you in the right direction by selling them at the right time. But um, in Knoxville, the last frost date, as you can see here, is April 18th or around then. And so what I usually do is on the week leading up to that, I look at the 10 day forecast and I check out to see if it's um, time or if we need to wait still because sometimes even at the end of April there will be um, another frost and so um, things like all these summer crops that you can read about up here tomatoes okra eggplants they do not like cold weather and if there's um, a freeze that happens it could kill them so um, always check the timing of when you should plant things um, and then there's the cool season crops. So spring and fall things like cabbage, broccoli, kale, lettuce, peas, arugula, carrots. So basically a lot of your leafy greens and a lot of your root vegetables and onions and garlic do very well in cool season. And some of these things you can plant in the fall and then you harvest in the spring. And so that means that they overwinter. Um, and there's also different ways. Some things don't naturally overwinter, but you can do season extensions with them. And that means um, covering them up on freezing nights or planting them in certain places that are warmer than others um, or covering them with extra straw. And we have a climate that is mild enough here in Knoxville that there's a lot that can survive through the winter. Um, so at Beardsley, we do. Of course, we overwinter our onion and garlic because they take a really long time to grow. Um, they need about six months, so we plant them in October usually, and then we'll harvest them. We'll harvest the garlic in June, and we'll harvest the onions probably in April. Um, and then I like to overwinter carrots too because they um, get sweeter when the temperature gets colder. And so um, you can also plant them in the spring and harvest them in late spring, but I think that carrots taste better. Um, plant it in fall and harvest it in spring. Um, and this little chart right here is great if you wanna reference it later. Um, it just gives you an idea of um, when to plant things, so early to mid spring or late spring to summer and then summer to fall. And so it gives a big long list of um, things that are common to plant around here and when you should do so. 
Um, this week at Beardsley, we are planting our potatoes. And so I always try to plant potatoes on the Ides of March and I'm a little late this year, but um, we are planting them on St. Patrick's Day. So that's just as good, I think. Um, and I will bring up this chart later because we'll talk about um, seeding versus transplanting, but some things are important to start from seed and some um, are better to start um, as a plant, which you can do yourself or you can buy. Okay, so now we are rolling along into our third section, um, planting and management. So I know that was a lot of information for preparation, but I really do think that um, getting everything prepped and planned will give you a lot less stress and work to do once you actually get your garden started. Um, so this is another little spot at Beardsley Farm. This is, looks like the end of the summer. Um, we have some zinnias here and it looks like we've got greens going and we're getting um, summer stuff out and starting to put some fall stuff in. Um, we're going to talk about direct seeding versus transplanting, maintaining fertility in your soil, um, mulching, watering, plant support, and some pest and disease information. So direct seeding, um, what that means is that is putting the seed that you have and putting it directly into the ground just like it sounds. Um, and so not everything can be direct seeded. And so that's why we have um, specific instructions on seed packets. And um, sometimes on the back, it'll say start indoors. And sometimes it'll say um, direct seed. And there's some plants that can do either. So um, common uh, plants that you want to direct seed are beets, chard, carrots, peas, potatoes, radish, spinach, um, a lot of the greens, and beans. Um, and there's two reasons usually that you would choose to do this. And the first reason is because um, the plant has very fragile roots and um, to transplant it would disturb the roots too much um, and risk the death of the plant. Um, so things like beets and carrots are examples of those. Um, and then there's also seeds that are just so easy to plant from seed. It wouldn't be worth it. It wouldn't be worth your money to buy that um, plant as a seedling and transplant it into the ground. It's just way more cost effective and less difficult to plant it directly from a seed. So things like that would be all of the greens um, and peas and spinach. Um, I will say that sometimes you just get a late start in your gardening because you have so much to do. And in that case, it might be um, it might be fine just to go and buy a kale or collard start um, just so that you can get a head start or if you've fallen behind. So that happens sometimes. Um, so here's a little example of the back of a seed packet. If you're ever in doubt, a lot of really great seed companies will have this advice on here and um, to make it um, compatible for everyone, no matter where they live. Um, it usually says recommended um, however many weeks before, before or after average last frost date. And so um, just to remind you guys, the last frost date here in Knoxville is the end of April, um, usually around April 18th, but you should also just check your weather. And um, there's also information on that left you see about um, how deep to plant the seed, how far apart to space the seed, um, and all that good stuff. So definitely refer to your seed packet if you need advice. Um, transplanting. So um, there's certain seeds or certain plants that you would want to transplant and 
Um, a lot of these are the, your summer plants. So tomatoes, eggplant, pepper, broccoli, cabbage, and cauliflower. And the reason that these get transplanted is because they need um, either an extra long warmer or cooler season to be able to grow in our climate. So right now at Beardsley, we are starting tomatoes and we, a couple of weeks ago, we started peppers and they need so long to grow and the weather right now for them to grow outside. And so that's why we start them inside of our greenhouse. Um, and we have another poll question here for you guys to answer. Um, have you ever started your plants um, from seed inside? Um, so it's, I know a lot of people who would just prefer to buy them because it can be um, like taking care of a little baby sometimes. But it's also really fun if you have a sunny south facing window and you have, or if you even have a greenhouse or um, like a, a heated sunroom, it's fun to do at home. And so I'll give you guys a few more seconds to answer that. Okay, so it looks like most of you haven't, but a good amount have, so that's really great. Um, and I think if you haven't done it before, I would recommend trying it. You can um, just get some soil from the store and get your little tomato plants and peppers and plant them and you just need to keep the soil very moist and make sure the area is very warm. Um, so I told you that this chart would come back up again. So it's another good way to reference whether or not you should be starting that particular vegetable from seed or from a transplant. And as you can see, some you can do either. Um, it really, for the ones you can do either, it depends on if you're getting a late start, you might want to just buy a transplant and put it in, or um, if your garden's not ready for the plant, you can transplant it. Um, but this is a good reference sheet to guide you. Um, and then here's another chart I found that um, shows you whether or not to direct so or to start indoors. And so um, it says tender varieties and heat loving plants start indoors. So like we were, like I was saying, the um, things like tomatoes and peppers, I start indoors always and basil and then direct so most root crops because their roots are very fragile in cold hardy plants. Um, so we'll go over some fertility management um, basically, this just means that throughout the growing season, even if you've prepped your soil, um, the plants in your garden are going to continually use up the nutrients in, in the beds. And so um, you want to um, make sure that you are adding compost or amendments as needed, um, maybe based on what your soil test said or um, even if you just add a little bit of compost and manure on, on the side, which is called side dressing. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit later about compost in more detail and also green mulch, which is cover crops. Um, and then mulching is a really great idea. So once you've got stuff planted and you um, have your vegetables coming up, what we like to do is mulch them. And examples can be straw, wood chips for perennials, shrubs and trees only, pine straw, ground cover, grass clippings, or black plastic. 
Um, and this really helps with retaining water so that you don't have to water as much. Um, weed suppression is a big one. So if you don't want to be out there weeding all the time, it's good to get um, some mulch on there to suppress those weeds for as long as possible. Um, it also adds organic matter. So over time, the straw and the wood chips and the pine straw, that all breaks down and composts its, on its own in the bed. Um, it also moderates the temperature, so it keeps it from getting um, too hot and dry in the summer and it keeps it warm in the winter. And it's also great for aisles. So we usually do cardboard and straw in the aisles or landscape fabric in the aisles, or even um, we use old billboard vinyls at Beardsley. Um, and we put those down just to suppress the weeds. And watering. So um, once your garden has been established, you wanna give it usually one to one and a half inches per week for vegetable gardens. Um, and each vegetable kind of has a different requirement. So you'll have to get used to what that is um, through practice or you could look it up. But most warm season crops, um, once they are established, they have really deep roots. And so they can um, tolerate some drought, which is what can happen in the summer. And then cool season crops usually have shallower roots, so they might need watering more regularly, but not as deeply. Um, and there's different types. There's overhead irrigation, which means spraying them with a hose or setting up a sprinkler. And then there's drip irrigation, which is if you can do it is what I recommend. Um, or either way, if you're going to be watering your plants, like with a watering can or anything overhead, um, I recommend spraying it at the base of the plant so that you don't burn the leaves. Um, the leaves actually don't need much water. It's really the root that needs the water. And so um, if you can water directly towards the base of the plant, that is better. Um, and plant support. So there's certain plants that actually need to climb up a trellis in order to be successful and give you the most amount of um, produce. And so, um, such as these pole beans that you see here in this picture. Um, also tomatoes are the two most popular ones that um, will need support. So as you're planting your garden, just keep in mind that you might wanna set up some bamboo trellises like we did here or tomato cages. Um, we also often will do something called Florida weaving. Um, it's a way to trellis tomatoes that's good for row, rows of tomatoes. Um, and then garden pests and diseases. So this is my cat and she is a pest, but she's also um, uh, something that can help keep other pests away. So she and also dogs, dogs and cats are really great at keeping squirrels and bunnies and any of the smaller animals like that away from your garden. So if you have them, um, let them go out and explore your garden and even their scent will help keep little things away. Um, and then aside from that, rotating your crops and companion planting, which we'll talk about, um, Manual removal of pests is often what we do at Beardsley Farm. So just um, taking off bugs that aren't going to be helpful to your garden. Sometimes you just need to remove them by, by hand. And then um, the number one way really though to keep a healthy garden is biodiversity and maintaining soil health. So just keep adding organic matter to your soil and keep it healthy. Um, and then grow a lot of different varieties of things, even if they're all mixed together, because um, oftentimes what you plant will attract good beneficial insects, which will keep away the bad ones. Um, so stewardship practices, I'll run through these things quickly because I think we're getting low on time here, but um, this is my favorite section and I think it's really important, um, not only for your own garden, but for the environment um, to pay attention to these things. 
So first, compost. And by the way, we have free compost at Beardsley Farm right now. And this picture is from last year, but it's in the same spot. And um, so this is really useful for the home garden because it's a mixture of organic materials, um, such as straw and leaves and vegetable scraps that um, decompose and then become really good soil after a while. Um, I could teach a whole hour long class just on composting, but I will just say that um, if you're able to compost at home or if you're able to get some like from Beardsley Farm, it's really great um, to add to your garden. It'll, it's um, nutrients and it will attract earthworms and aerators. Um, and of course you're diverting uh, vegetable scraps from the landfill and you can also save money if you do it at home. Um, companion planting. So this is something we do a lot of at Beardsley and that just means planting multiple things in one garden. And so um, a lot of times you'll just see rows of crops at a farm and that's um, monoculture or monocrop and um, that's maybe for a time being um, more productive if you're just trying to grow one thing but for a home garden, I truly recommend um, planting a lot of stuff together. And this uh, repeats back to the biodiversity comment I said earlier, but um, basically, if you have a lot of different types of plants together, they usually have ways of benefiting each other. And so the most common um, to think about is three sisters, and this is an indigenous practice of planting corn and then pole beans that climb up the stalks of corn, and then squash that sprawls along the bottom and um, helps to suppress weeds. And so this is a really common way to grow three plants together, and they all take up their space in a different way, and they all benefit each other in a different way. Um, Beardsley also plants lots of marigolds and other flowers in our and herbs and in our vegetable gardens. Uh, so this is a little nifty guide if you want to um, figure out certain things that are good to plant with other things. And you can find a lot of these online um, if you're ever not sure when you're starting to plant your garden which things you should plant together. Um, and crop rotation. So at, this is an example of our one of our farm maps at Beardsley Farm. Um, since 1998 until today, we keep track of everything we plant in every bed and we rotate crop families. Um, and this is important for disease control and nutrient maintenance. And that's because different crop families are susceptible to different diseases and they take up different nutrients. And so if you rotate things around, um, you'll be sure not to keep taking the same nutrients out of the soil. Um, and this little chart here is great to show you a very basic way that you can rotate your crops. And so I would recommend um, doing a map of your garden and just making sure you're not planting the same thing in the same bed year after year. Um, and then cover crops are one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, there's a lot of benefits, but um, you can see here adding nutrients to the soil, suppressing weeds, retaining moisture, adding organic matter, and it's a food source for shelter, a food source and shelter for wildlife. And so cover crops are just certain types of seeds that you can throw into the ground and grow in your garden. So um, some of those are listed here, but there's even more. Um, and these, can be, um, so we have some gardens at Beardsley and we grow cover crop during the down season, so over the winter. Um, and then with buckwheat, that's one that we grow with our crops um, during the summer. And so planting bees alongside your crops or during a resting season can help um, your soil immensely. And then pollinators. So we plant lots of flowers within our vegetables in order to attract 
um, good insects to the garden and for food and shelter for different insects and um, it also adds beauty and color to the landscape so we love having lots of flowers at the farm and we have some resources here for you all to look at and I also um, there will be an email coming to you that has um, five or six PDFs from either um, Tennessee uh, UT Ag Extension or from Beardsley Farm to give you um, some printed materials that you can take with you out into your garden as you're planning and prepping for things. Um, and I think we have about five minutes left if anyone has questions or if there were any questions throughout the talk that I could answer. Uh, Charlotte, this is Mike Stella. I do have one question uh, in regards to okay. is is Beardsley Farms would be considered mostly an organic farm? Is that would that be an accurate statement or? Yeah, we do everything organically at Beardsley Farm. We are not a certified organic farm since we're not selling our produce. Um, all of it gets donated, and so. We don't have any reason to spend the money on a certification, but um, yeah, we don't use any chemicals or herbicides um, or anything like that. Just lots of volunteer sweat. Okay. Uh, let's see, I've got a question here that says, do you have any tips for materials to use uh, to build raised beds? Uh, they say they're curious about mm -hmm. alternatives to wood that might last longer. Hmm, that's a great question. Um, so I've done some raised beds with cinder blocks before, um, and those that actually can help um, retain the heat as well and make it warmer um, if you're wanting to do cool season crops and um, extend your season a bit. So bricks or cinder blocks. Um, let's see, we actually, have some um, stone beds as well. So yeah, those are the first ones that are coming to mind, but um, I can think of a little bit more about that. Okay, I have another one that says, what do you think about burying leftover veggies uh, and cardboard directly into the soil, uh, into the garden soil? I do this over the winter and it's usually composted by spring. Yeah, I would say as long as um, you're essentially composting, if you do that, and as long as you're not planting as soon as you put that organic matter into the garden, um, I would say that's okay. As So you're giving it enough time to break down into um, something that the plant can take up as nutrients. Um, I wouldn't ever put vegetable scraps directly into my vegetable bed when things are growing in there, though. Um, yeah. Okay, um, let's say I, have a, I just have a comment in the question that just says, this is great information. Um, and I guess we can wait a couple minutes and see if there's any any further questions. Okay, sounds good. Um, Charlotte, I see a couple of questions here as well. Um, please uh, let me know, how do you go about installing drip irrigation? Mm. That's a good question. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but um, I think the most accessible for a home gardener is um, purchasing something called um, drip tape or uh, soaker hoses 
And essentially what you do is connect your hose to these lines and they'll allow for water to slowly drip out into your garden beds. So it looks like a long hose, um, but it has little holes in it. So um, you can just turn it on and set a timer for an hour um, or so and then let the water drip out from your um, soaker hose into your garden. And um, generally um, that can save you time if you have that set up because you can just turn it on and leave um, and come back to it. Um, and it also, the plants really prefer getting the water um, from the base and getting it right into the soil. And so um, it avoids you potentially burning the tops of the leaves by watering them from overhead from a hose. Okay, thanks Charlotte. We have another question. Um, what resource would you suggest for the beginning composter? Maybe a web resource, something you would know about? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I will have to look into that, but um, if you leave your contact information, I can email you some resources. Um, if you have time to come to Beardsley Farm, I can give you a 20 minute intro about composting if you are interested. Okay, so um, yes, if you can leave your contact information, name and email and chat, we will pass that on to Charlotte. Another uh, question, where do you get compost uh, to amend your soil if you don't have your own? And I think you answered that. Does Beardsley have free compost? Yeah. We have free compost right now and um, it runs out eventually, of course, and so um, if you need to purchase it, I would recommend um, Living Earth Organics. They're a soil company in Knoxville, and I've gone through lots of soil companies, and they're my favorite. Um, and they have different um, compost mixtures and soil mixtures that are really great for filling up raised beds. And again, that's Living Earth is the name of the company. Okay, Charlotte, uh, one more question here. Um, if I'm just getting mm -hmm. started and want to start small, how much space do I need and how many different things would you recommend planting? Hmm, that's a great question. It, it kind of all depends on how much space is available to you and how much time you have and how much you would like to grow for yourself. So um, I would start out with maybe one raised bed that's um, three feet by six or seven or eight feet. Um, that would be a really great place to start. And then if you love it, you can build more raised beds. Um, if you want to start even smaller than that, you could just grow in containers. So I've seen people use five gallon buckets to grow tomatoes in, one tomato plant per bucket. Um, so that's an even easier, cheaper way to start out. Um, but it depends what, how much um, you want to grow, how many people are in your family who would want to eat vegetables and all that. But um, yeah, there's a lot of ways to start small and um, see how much you like it. Um, Charlotte, um, someone said that they would like some basic information on greenhouses. Should I ask them to leave their contact information, name and email to get back with you on that? Or? Yeah, yeah okay. that works. I can send information. Okay, um, another question. Do I need to call before I visit Beardsley Farms to pick up free compost? Also, how long would you recommend letting horse manure chill out before you use it, <laughs> chill out, before you use it in the garden soil? Yeah. Um, so to get compost from Beardsley, you don't need to call, you can just come. Uh, we're 
putting a sign up today, actually, that um, leads you to there. But the picture in the slide, I don't know if you remember it, but it's right by our apiary where we keep bees um, and next to a shed. Um, but if you come during our hours between 8 and 4.45, there will be someone there that can show you where to get it if you get lost. Um, and then what was the second part of the question? Oh, how long should you let horse manure age? At least six months or longer. A year is great, but six months will work too. And I don't put fresh manure on the garden beds because um, one, it can um, burn your vegetables. So it's just way too much nitrogen for the vegetables and it could kill them. Um, and then also just, I just think that um, there's a risk of disease possibly. Um, and so I, make sure that that's all composted and it's kind of the same reason why you wouldn't want to just like put fresh banana peels into your garden bed is it's um not broken down yet and so it needs at least six months thank you charlotte another question um why are my plants mm -hmm. dying when i plant them in season um even when i give fertilizer what could be some reasons for that happening Mm, there's too many um, possible reasons for me to give any explanation without knowing more information, but um, I mean, the main things could be not enough light, not enough water, um, not enough nutrients, but it's hard to know without many more details. Okay. Any recommendations on containers, I guess, for container gardening? Hmm. Um, well, for smaller containers, um, it just depends on your budget, but if you want to get um, ceramic pots are really great. Um, five gallon buckets do the job. Honestly, anything that can hold soil works. And so um, I've seen people grow things out of like um, burlap sacks. I've seen people grow um, out of, you know, tires, which I wouldn't fully recommend because I don't really know what chemicals are in tires, but um, I think what I'm trying to get at is any container that can hold soil um, and not um, and hold moisture will work. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another one. Uh, years ago, I had an aunt who grew tinderette beans. Do you have that variety at Beardsley Farms or do you know where it may be purchased? Hmm. Could you say the name of it again? Uh, Tinderette beans. Hmm. No, I don't know what those are, but I could look into it for you. We work with um, a farmer named Steve Todd, who's uh, he specializes in growing a lot of really cool varieties of vegetables and particularly beans. So um, I could get you in contact with him or I could um, ask him for you. Thank you. Um, I had an attendee or two raise a hand. If you could uh, post a question in the Q&A, uh, the questions part of your control panel, that would help us. Another question, how does the volunteer program at Beersley work? Are there certain days and times that you show up or do you need to sign up in advance? Yeah, so um, there's a sign up sheet, and um, if you are interested, you could email beardsleyfarm at gmail.com. And I don't know if someone's able to put that in the chat, but um, that email will get you one of our staff people and we'll send you our schedule um, 
for the spring and fall, we have morning and afternoon hours during the week and then some Saturday work days. And then on um, in the summer, we work usually between eight and noon um, with volunteers for farm work, um, Monday through Friday and some Saturdays. And so we always have openings and we have a lot of um, stuff to do right now on the farm. So we would love your help. Okay, thank you, Charlotte. How early is too early to direct seed things like carrots, kale, and Swiss chard? It's a really great time to start spring vegetables like that. Um, Beardsley started theirs. So we started ours two weeks ago, um, but you could get some of that stuff in the ground right now, too. Um, we usually I usually do all of our root vegetables, carrots, beets, turnips, um, first week of March. So no, it's not too early. It's it's right on time. OK, um, suggestions for avoiding the worms that eat through cucumbers. I seem to get those every year and do not get to harvest any of my cucumbers. Hmm. That's a good one. Um, well, my first couple of recommendations are making sure your soil is really strong and then planting a lot of really strong smelling herbs and marigolds around your cucumbers. So we just do like a wall barrier of marigolds wherever your cucumbers are, and that um, can usually be really helpful. And then lastly, um, I will sometimes use insecticidal soap, which you can make homemade or you can buy, but it's basically just soapy water. And if um, you spray that on your cucumbers, um, most things won't want to bite through that. And you can um, look online to see um, some recipes for insecticidal soap, or you can get it at a place like Knox Seed and Greenhouse or Mayo Garden Center. Thank you, Charlotte. Another question. If I come to pick up compost, what type of container should I bring? Do I need a shovel? Yes, I would bring a shovel in case um, we are not open and um, um, you could bring, I've seen people bringing five gallon buckets to fill, fill up with compost. Um, and if you're lucky and you have a truck, you can fill up to one half, um, of your bed with compost, your truck bed. Um, you could also bring like, um, those big, uh, like plastic totes, fill that up with compost. Um, any any big container you have. Thank you, Charlotte. Another question, if planting mm -hmm. raised beds, um, excuse me, um, where can we go to get some of the vegetables or herbs grown on the farm? Um, we have a plant sale. Um, we have one on March 20th and one on April, I think, 24th. Um, I'll look it up. It's a Saturday. Um, so we have a few things for sale that we sell for a fundraiser for the farm. Um, yeah, the 24th of April. And that information can be found on our website at beardsleyfarm.org. And then, um, if you qualify as low income, we have an application on our website as well. And um, you can get free seedlings, which would include tomato, pepper, and basil starts that are given away at the end of April. I may have missed this one. I don't know. Uh, what? wood type do you recommend for raised beds? Also, I have been putting cardboard in new raised beds, then adding garden soil. Is that a good practice? Yeah, that's a great idea. I do that with all of my raised beds. Um, one, it, it'll break down eventually, and 
um, to it adds a protective layer between the soil and the weeds that might grow up. So um, yeah, that's a great idea. And um, the very best wood, which is expensive, is cedar because it's the least resistant to rot. Um, but it's very expensive, and so um, any any wood um, that you can afford is good wood. But just know that if you use something like pine, um, you'll have to probably replace it in depending on the site. Um, five to seven years. Um, so hardwoods are going to last longer and then things like pine will rot faster. But um, of course, pine is the cheapest and hardwoods are more expensive. Okay, if planting raised beds, do I need to use a ground cover before filling the beds? Yeah, so the cardboard would be a really great idea. You can also do um, a layer of um, breathable landscape fabric. Um, that'll just help keep the weeds um, suppressed for a pretty long time. Um, but you don't necessarily have to. Um, you could just, you know, get the sod off all of the grass layer and then um, fill it right up with dirt if you wanted to, but the cardboard will definitely be helpful. Okay, uh, Charlotte, I guess we will um, call an end to the Q&A session. If you had a question that we missed, feel free to send it through chat. Um, and perhaps Charlotte would be gracious uh, to answer that um, for you in the future, name and email address. So Charlotte, thank you for your presentation today. Um, I encourage uh, those of you in the audience to check out Beardsley Community Farms website where you can find out their hours and more about volunteer opportunities or schedule a tour of their gardens. Beardsley is an accessible and inspiring model of ecology, I have found, uh, and it's one that we can take back with us to our gardening life. Also, thanks for coming today. You'll receive a copy of our Seed Saver newsletter via email. The newsletter published seasonally offers details about upcoming speakers, library resources, and tips for seed saving. Among the worldwide Wednesday monthly programs held on the third Wednesday of each month, three are dedicated to topics on some aspect of gardening. Our next gardening-centered program is May 19th and is titled Canning, Freezing, and Drying, Secrets to Preserving the Flavor of Summer. Laura Clark, an extension agent and co-director with Anderson County Branch of the University of Tennessee Extension Office, will be our panelist. Our final Worldwise Wednesday Garden Topic of the Year will be August 18th and is titled Adventures in Seed Saving, How to Be a Biodiversity Hero. Additional upcoming Webinars include Library Databases and Resources 101, What's at the Library with Virginia Spence, our Technology Specialist, and it will be on Wednesday, March 25th from 1 to 2 p.m. This webinar highlights available library resources and how to use them. For genealogy lovers, register for Solving Mysteries with DNA with Mike Stallo, our Local History Specialist, on Wednesday, April 21st from 12 noon to 1 p.m. Finally, we are in the process of developing a Seed Savers Club for Oak Ridge Public Library patrons. If you are interested in being a part of the Seed Savers Club, just reply yes in the newsletter email and we will follow up with program details. Um, also, uh, towards the end of this uh, program, there is a survey. It would be so helpful if you'd be willing to take 30 seconds to uh, respond to the survey. It helps us to plan uh, better programs in the future. And remember to come see us inside the library when we open beginning on March 29th, 10 to 6, Monday through Saturday. Again, Charlotte, thank you so much for your presentation today. I think uh, a lot of us learned a lot about gardening and, and we're kind of uh, feeling that enthusiasm to get out there and, and garden this year. So thank you very much. Happy gardening to everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you.
everyone have a great day and thank you for joining us.